licensing project. Um, during our webinar today, we'll be discussing successful campaigns to reform the felony drug ban on food assistance. In 2014, state advocates achieved legislative reforms in California and Missouri to eliminate the federal ban on food stamps for people with felony drug convictions. As documented in the Sentencing Project's re recent report, A Lifetime of Punishment, the welfare reform package passed by Congress in 1996 included a provision to subject people with felony drug convictions to a lifetime ban on cash assistance and food stamps, a policy which has had a disparate impact on women, children, and people of color. This webinar will highlight the political and communication strategies in states that have re achieved recent reform. Our first presenter will be Nicole Porter, Director of Advocacy at the Sentencing Project, who coordinates state legislative and public education campaigns and works closely with advocates at the state and local level in planning their media and advocacy strategies to advance criminal justice reform. Nicole will go over some background information about the felony drug ban and its impact today, as well as the current political climate for reform. Next, we'll hear from Jessica Bartholo, a legislative advocate at the Western Center on Law and Poverty with nearly two decades of experience in anti-poverty organizing, advocacy, and program development at the local, state, and national level. Jessica will provide an overview of the strategy to expand benefits for individuals with certain drug felony convictions in California. Our third presenter will be Jeanette Mott-Oxford, who is the Executive Director for the Missouri Association of Social Welfare. Jeanette is an activist and former elected official who represented a portion of St. Louis in the Missouri House of Representatives. Jeanette will discuss the legislative strategy that successfully led to Missouri's opting out of the full ban on SNAP benefits for people with prior felony convictions. All of the webinar slides, as well as a recording of the webinar, will be available online after the webinar is over. And there will be a Q&A session after the presentation, um, during which you can submit your questions electronically. Um, you might have questions as the presentation unfolds, but we recommend writing them down as you think of them and then submitting, submitting them at the end, because often questions that you have earlier in the presentation might be answered later on. Um, another thing is if you're directing your question to a specific presenter, make sure to note um, who that question is for. And with that, I'll give it over to Nicole. Thanks so much, Jean, and thanks to all the participants for um, calling in this afternoon. The purpose of this call is to hear about recent victories from states that changed um, the law with respect to the federal lifetime ban on food stamp benefits for persons with felony drug convictions. Uh, we will start with a brief history and then hear from state advocates in Missouri and California who will share their political strategy and stories of tenacious commitment to reform. We'll wrap up the call with a Q&A discussion where call participants can ask targeted questions. As many of you know, the 1996 um, Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, or otherwise known as welfare, reform included several expansive provisions, including a denial of federal benefits to persons um, convicted in state or federal courts of felony drug offenses. The ban is imposed for no other offense but drug crimes. Its provisions subject individuals who are otherwise eligible for receipt of federal food stamp benefits, known as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, and benefits under temporary assistance to needy families or TANF program to a lifetime disqualification that applies to all states unless those states act to opt out of the ban. By 2001, eight states and the District of Columbia had entirely opted out of the ban, while an additional 20 states had modified it. In the last decade, more states have joined the ranks of those that do not fully enforce the drug crime exclusion ban. Today, we will hear from two of them, California and Missouri, on how they did that. Currently, 37 states either fully or partially enforce the TANF ban, while 34 states either fully or partially enforce the SNAP ban. Of these states, half have modified the ban to allow individuals with felony drug convictions to receive TANF or SNAP benefits under certain circumstances. Advocates can find a full listing of states in these categories in our report titled, A Lifetime of Punishment, the impact of the felony drug ban on welfare benefits available on our website at sentencingproject.org. 
I want to wrap up my comments with the potential impact of these bans on individuals and their families. Researchers at the Sentencing Project estimated in a, two in a 2013 analysis that more than 180,000 women who live in 12 states may be affected, may be affected by the TANF ban at some point in their lives. While the bans don't specifically target any demographic group, the dynamics of class and the disparate racial effects of criminal justice policy and practice combine and result in a highly disparate effects on women, children, and communities of color. I want to briefly highlight a few contributing factors that lead to these disparate policies. Now, those factors include the prevalence of women who receive public benefits, changes in drug enforcement practices since 1985 that have led to an increase in the number of women charged with drug offenses, and racial disparities in the enforcement of the war on drug policies despite similar rates of reported drug use across racial categories. Now with that, we want to hear from the states and Jessica and Jeanette in terms of how their campaigns led to reforms in recent years. So I'll turn it over to Jessica. Hi everybody. Are you able to hear me? Great. Um, I'm just going to go ahead. It looks like I am, you can hear my sound check okay. Again, I'm Jessica Bartholo with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. And uh, we're located in, in California, in Sacramento, in the state's capital, and work statewide uh, with organizations to, um, to reform laws and protect the rights of low-income Californians. Go ahead, next slide. Please. Thank you. Um, when I talk today about the coalition effort to lift the ban, I'm talking about the efforts of a lot of organizations and a lot of people. Um, just to be clear, uh, these are not uh, West. Uh, you know, lifting the ban was not uh, done by Western Center alone. It it was um, only achieved only achieved by a large coalition of grassroots, grass tops, think tanks, um, and policy change organizations around the state. Um, and also uh, by the elevation of people's individual stories. Um, you know, it, it, it's so easy to kind of to think in a, in a framework that um, making things hard for people with a drug, drug felony conviction might actually prevent um, drug use or drug sales or manufacturing uh, until you start to hear the stories. It's in our campaign, the stories told by countless Californians across the many years that we worked on this campaign were very important to dismantle um, the, the really incorrect assumptions that uh, led people to support uh, this kind of policy. Um, so here I list uh, a number of the organizations, but also on the left-hand side you can see um, the many logos. And we actually had a two-side a, a two-sided paper with colored logos that we tagged to our hearings. And so when I was um, at, a, at a hearing in the, you know, at 9 o'clock at night at the Capitol, and I, I had these logos with me, it was as if all of those people, all of those organizations were there in the room with me. Um, and that was a big part of our campaign is that we worked together. Um, we, had bi we had weekly uh, conference calls that lasted for the last two weeks of the campaign and continue now on a monthly basis to help implement it. Next, next slide, please. So the lifetime ban here in California, in every state, it, it kind of plays out a little bit different, especially in the TANF program. And that's because every state has a different kind of TANF program. In our state, the way that it works is that um, the lifetime ban denies, denies food through the CalFresh program, but also denies $128 a month, the adult portion, um, of aid through TANF to the TANF household uh, member with the prior conviction. But it also denies child care to the children in the household um, if there's not another adult who's participating in work. And this is because the adult is ineligible for aid and therefore ineligible for uh, the work supports like job training and uh, transportation to and from work and child care. The extra pressure, uh, in addition to the impact on the family and, and the sentencing projects, projects piece uh, really documents uh, what this looks like, 
Um, there's also extra pressure on food banks, on rehabilitation centers, and on child care agencies and systems to fill in the gaps. You know, it's not as if, um, as if somebody with a prior drug felony conviction doesn't have to eat. They are human and um, they need to eat. And so in order to fill the gaps of this policy, uh, food banks had to, you know, were stepping up um, at higher rates, soup kitchens, food banks. Um, and in addition, what we learned uh, through the years of the campaign is that the rehab centers uh, really felt a pinch here too. Rehab centers can use food stamp benefits, uh, SNAP benefits, in addition to town of benefits to help fill in the gaps and create extra beds. So, you know, while the argument was that um, was that people uh, it was that this ban would reduce drug crimes. It actually reduced the amount of help that was available to people who were seeking to recover um, and and prevent recidivism and drug use. Um, and in addition to child care, we we had a number of families that were on the waiting list for for child care, and also in a separate program, subsidized child care, meant for have families um, who weren't on TANF or eligible for TANF. Um, you know, in California, we had we have the second highest recidivism rate. I point that on a, on a later slide, um, but the research, as you'll see, um, clearly identifies lack of access to basic needs support as a as a contributor to recidivism. And one of the ways in which we started to talk about recidivism in our campaign was that um, recidivism results from increased crime. So when you think about, when, when you and other states are talking about recidivism, to think about um, how to also frame that in, in a context of safety and community safety in low-income communities, you can only recidivate if you re-repeat a crime. Um, and, and so we, we felt like that was important to highlight as well. Um, it also increased time on aid. There is a report out of um, California that shows an increase of about 5% um, more time spent on TANF assistance for families that, uh, that have an adult who's ineligible for the, the work support and retraining available through TANF. So again, contrary um, to this kind of hard knock uh, way of thinking, people, you know, people don't find their way out of poverty when they're not able to get the same help that very low income people without a drug felony conviction can receive and need to receive to, um, to find employment and to maintain employment. Um, no, next slide, please. Um, and, and just at the bottom of that last slide, I have a little note that there was no proof, no evidence that any of the drug felony repeals actually helped anything. Um, you know, through the years of advocating for this, we were always asked, you know, does anybody have any evidence that this is um, that this is helping, that this is reducing crime? And in fact, um, we had no evidence that it was, and and we're never never able to identify that. And I think that that is important in identifying this uh, this ban as a failed social policy. So, in the context of California. Um, you know, we had we had legislation here, AB 109, which real what's called prison realignment. What that basically did was it took funding spent on federal prisons and sent it to local jurisdictions in the counties um, for jail. Um, and and with it came people who were imprisoned in um, in the state prison system, but for nonviolent offenses and most of them drug felony convictions. Um, and sent them into uh, the purview of the local county sheriffs. And the purpose, the idea, um, this was introduced by, or this was an idea proposed and pushed forward by um, Governor Brown. And his, his thought was if we pushed the problem closer to the local community, that the solutions would also come forward from those communities. Um, and, uh, and several people were released into the community on probation, parole, or um, another kind of supervised release. Um, part and parcel with this, with this change was that uh, the local governments would work together um, in creating uh, councils, both that included probation, parole, the sheriffs, the county um, supervisors, the county public benefit agencies, and other uh, 
housing and other providers in the community to identify the best ways to prevent recidivism um, in that county. And this happened throughout California. And through those conversations uh, in the last couple of years, there was a growing understanding of how important basic needs assistance were in preventing recidivism. At that same time, the state uh, was in court because of an overcrowding in our prison system. Um, and the governor actually testified at that point that, there, you know, that the state was doing everything we could to prevent um, high prison population. And that's where, our, um, that, that's where our coalition weighed in and said, actually, we know that um, a large part of res uh, the prison population are recidivating, um, you know, people recidivating from the community uh, because they lack supports that they need, and the evidence shows, shows that to be true. Um, and so we continue to use the state court um, overcrowding, the high recidivism rate, the, the administration's real desire to make AB 109 work, um, to push forward in the last two years of our work and after having, as you see, several years of failed attempts in the legislature. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to, you know, I've talked a little bit about this, but the new research really helped. For years we've been asked, um, you know, well, what is the proof that it doesn't work? And where is the evidence? And can any, on the states that ended the ban, can they show that they had reduced recidivism rates? Can they show that there weren't increased um, benefit trafficking resulting from re removing the ban? And we, you know, kind of every year do a call out to our colleagues across the country and and nobody really had anything. Until recently, there's, there's been a, a, a lot of really great research showing um, both kind of the impact of high recidivism rate, which in California is very high, um, but also the role that basic needs assistance like, like food um, and housing and health can play in reducing recidivism. A, a great study I found is actually a little bit older, but I didn't find it until recently, showed that specifically among women, the impact of basic needs support um, was significant reducing recidivism by as much as 83 percent. Um, and this was positive because they, they, they figured that, the researchers figured that women um, were more often to enter into a, into a life where they used drugs or sold or trafficked drugs because of poverty and deep poverty. Um, and, and having this women-based women, this women -based research was really important here in California and, and probably throughout the country as people are looking at inequities that disproportionately impact women. So I encourage you to look into that specifically. Um, and then also reducing the costly cycle of imprisonment. Anybody who's worked on a um, multi-year or even longer than a decade campaign knows that some, sometimes the little wins add up. And one of the little wins that, that we got uh, two years ago was the fiscal, um, the fiscal committee in the state senate identified exactly what these potential savings would be. And so for the first time, put in a legislative document estimated savings resulting from the ban in, in pr local prison costs. Next screen, please. Um, so you know, these are just really provocative pictures. You can, uh, will you press a couple of times I didn't, um, to make sure that the text shows up? OK, there you go. Um, Really important, I think, to the campaign was that we didn't give up. So we identified about 15 years ago the coalition, the anti-hunger coalition, a couple of local food, food banks doing advocacy, um, and um, and our allies in um, in the prison reentry community um, that we were not going to we weren't going to stop. That we were going to continue to try to introduce. Um, and the issue to Sacramento, if we couldn't get a bill, we'd continue to keep it on our talking points um, and that it would be there every single year until we got it. Um, and, that, and that if we got pieces of it, we'd still keep fighting for the rest of it. So this was a commitment a number of, of us made to each other and to the work years ago and, and, we, and we stood by it. I think that that was an important message to Sacramento that this issue is not going away and that we're going to continue to bring it forward um, 
and we did that. And um, uh, you can see that we did win a piece of it. You know, one opportunity that we had when Arnold Schwarzenegger took office was that he was he he had uh, admitted to using drugs illegal illegally, um, actually in a video that people might know about. Um, and we thought that that was a good opportunity to talk about um, how people can change and turn things around and deserve a second chance. And it turns out that it was. And we were able to get a partial reveal that year in 2004 through AB 1794 um, by then Assemblymember, now Senator Leno. Um, other bills had uh, other bills that we had pers uh, pursued um, before then and after then were either vetoed or held in the fiscal committee. Um, but again, at the Usually within a week after um, after that loss, we would meet and convene again and put together a plan for the next year. Next slide, please. That's okay. So the next legislative so so our winning legislative uh, effort began in 2013, where we started to change how we real how we spoke about the ban as being. Um, as being access to jobs. Specifically, TANF and food stamps both have um, employment avenues and retraining and support. And the evidence was showing that increased access to jobs it was really the key to um, So through SB um, 283, introduced by Public Safety Chairwoman Lonnie Hancock, um, that was then uh, reintroduced this year in February um, as SB 1029. We were able to um, we were able to to push forward um, a vision of a, a talking points around the bill that were the most successful. In the end, we didn't bring that bill to the Senate floor because there were some amendments that we didn't like taken in one of the fiscal committees. Next slide, please. So uh, the final kind of the way that we were able to get this through is through um, the bicameral public safety budgets. These budgets were forced to kind of look at how do we address the prison overcrowding um, and how do we address the high cost of imprisonment in California and through that lens applied this policy change as one of the potential solutions through a, a reinvestment in justice um, portion of the budget. One of my favorite parts about this win is that we didn't just win a policy change, but we actually won how Sacramento talks about people who are uh, reentering the community and trying to start things anew. Um, the law had previously referred to people with a conviction as drug felons. The law actually struck out that language and now refers to people as people with a prior drug felony conviction. Um, we, and we also spoke about the policy change as simply equalizing the treatment of, of people with a felony conviction in the programs, which was helpful. Um, and also, um, you know, we, we continue to maintain the bans um, for people who are not complying with probation or parole. This was also really helpful to get the probation and parole officers on board and in support. Uh, next slide. So that's it for now. I look forward to the questions and answers and some of the presentations from my colleagues and really want to just say thank you so much for, um, to the Sentencing Project uh, for having this call and creating this national community and look forward to fighting with all of you to repeal the ban nationally. Thank you. So I think uh, maybe I'm jumping right in. This is Jeanette Mott Oxford from the Missouri Association for Social Welfare. Um, if you'll uh, go to the next slide. Uh, we were started in 1901 uh, as the Missouri Conference on Corrections and Charities. Uh, this was a group that uh, sort of met just on an annual basis, uh, philanthropists, people from charities, people from uh, uh, a, a variety of, of helping agencies. Uh, and uh, they would use the latest in, in, uh, in research to talk about large social issues. Uh, but over time, uh, our, our members started to um, meet year-round as opposed to having just an annual conference. And our, uh, we're, we're currently in our third name over our more than 100-year history uh, and considering rebranding shortly that may take us into a fourth name. Uh, our mission is to uh, use research, education, 
uh, leadership and advocacy to improve public policies and programs that impact on the health and welfare of all people in Missouri. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, our members work geographically in chapters. Uh, for example, in the urban areas, Kansas City and St. Louis, we have chapters. We also have chapters in rural areas like southeast Missouri. Uh, so people are able to work with, uh, with other members that are close to them uh, on local issues and on, on our priority issues of the year that we set. But some folks also want to, to work on a particular uh, topic that is uh, their burning passion. So we've also organized task forces on affordable housing and homelessness, criminal justice, economic justice, health and mental health, human rights and hunger. And at least three of these task forces made the ban on uh, receiving SNAP if you had a prior uh, drug felony conviction uh, a priority for their particular task force because they saw the connections. That would be um, uh, the, the criminal justice task force, the human rights task force, and the hunger task forces that particularly worked on, this, uh, on that issue. Next slide, please. Uh, as uh, Jessica mentioned earlier, and as Nicole mentioned, we certainly had lots of evidence that this uh, was not a successful uh, policy. Other states were opting out. Uh, Missouri, unfortunately, often does not uh, lead the pack on when, when there's something that needs to be changed. We tend to be a little farther back, and in this case we were again, but uh, uh, good things don't happen if you don't uh, stay in there being persistent. Uh, so uh, we, we continue to ask for a change in this. Uh, we certainly heard from our allies that work in drug rehab uh, that uh, addicts are more apt to relapse if they're hungry. 12-step uh, programs do use that acronym of HALT, H-A-L-T, uh, to help people know that they shouldn't get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, or they increase their chances of relapse. Uh, we also, in our hunger task force, have a lot of people that work with food pantries uh, in, in participation in that task force. Uh, they would report that, that they were uh, having to use a variety of rationing mechanisms in order to try to make their food stretch enough. Uh, sometimes uh, they would only serve people once every three months or every six months, or uh, they uh, uh, you know, sometimes took waiting lists of, of people. And one of the causes for shortages that they reported is that some members of families could not access SNAP uh, due to prior drug felonies. Next slide, please. Uh, our organization started working on this uh, in 2006, uh, and we did that in a variety of ways. Uh, at our annual conference, we would generally have a workshop that touched on this. Uh, in the, the chapter forums, uh, at least once a year, we would tend to have uh, a presentation that focused on this issue to help people in, uh, in uh, the different regions of Missouri know about uh, the ban. And, you know, the average Missourian would say, what? When we tell them this, they couldn't believe that, that uh, if you were paroled for murder or, or uh, some really heavy-duty crimes, that you could have access to SNAP, uh, but that if you had a drug felony, you were banned for life. It didn't make sense to people once they knew about it, but too, too few people knew about it. Uh, we tried to make sure that people did know about it through uh, getting editorials written, through submitting letters to the editor. Uh, over time, we finally were able to secure a, uh, a sponsor, but from the minority party. In, in Missouri, currently, the Democrats are the minority party, the Republicans are the majority party. Uh, at first, we couldn't get a hearing on the bill. Uh, finally, we would have a hearing in the Senate where, where we first had a sponsor, and then in time we had a uh, sponsor on the House side as well. Uh, the bills were, were dying in committee uh, in the early years. Uh, once we, I think in 2012, we finally got it out of out of committee in the House, but it was not on the chairman of the committee's uh, priority list for bills to go to the floor for debate. Uh, but we were moving the ball down the field um, uh, a little bit at a time. Uh, and then Missouri, being one of those states that has term limits, uh, we were faced with the distressing situation of having our sponsors term out and having to line up new champions. Uh, to take on uh, the issue for us. Um, we also have an annual student advocacy day with uh, around 200 students present sometimes, and uh, many of those student advocacy days uh, highlighted this as an issue. Next slide, please. The winning combination that we had in 2014 is that we broadened our coalition 
uh, bringing in a really diverse uh, group of folks to work with us. The Grocers Association and the Retailers Association uh, were our business groups. Uh, we had some pro-life groups uh, that, um, that stressed that they're consistently pro-life uh, and take on um, more than just abortion as an issue. And so they did some work on this issue in the Capitol, a whole variety of religious groups. Uh, covering the spectrum of, of religion from those that are perceived to be more to the left and those that are perceived to be more to the right, uh, and then social justice groups uh, uh, such as uh, uh, MASW and, and uh, uh, some of the, the groups that work on justice on drug sentencing laws, for example, uh, were involved with us. We had local support, statewide groups supporting us, and national groups supporting us like the Justice Fellowship, the Sentencing Project and Bread for the World uh, are some that, that gave us some levels of, of support at the national level. Uh, we set up weekly calls early on, I think starting as early as, as December or January. Our session runs from January to May. We had a weekly call uh, at least starting in late January. Um, I think we may have had a call or two before that. Uh, on those calls, because uh, you, know, you never know who's going to pass around your notes with the call-in number, we were careful not to say anything on the call that we wouldn't say in front of uh, an opponent if there, if there was some organized opposition out there. Uh, and there wasn't particularly organized opposition out there, but we wanted to be cautious not to give away strategy points uh, that, that an opponent could use against us. There were a handful of legislators who were strong opponents, uh, so that's who I would identify as someone who would have been working against the bill. Um, uh, I am a former state representative, uh, I served from 2005 to 2012, and then we had a senator who served uh, from the Democratic Party and a senator who served from the Republican Party who worked with me as our Under the, uh, the Dome team leaders, uh, networking with some other lobbyists, uh, again from some of the religious and the, the pro-life groups um, uh, and other supportive organizations, uh, social justice groups that, that could work with us. Uh, we would. Uh, kind of tag team about who would be the most effective person to go see someone. One of my fa favorite days in the campaign was when I went to call on a very conservative vice chair of one of the committees, uh, uh, and um, I sent a, my card in by the doorman at the, the, the side of the uh, House of Representatives to pull this legislator out, and I told him I was there to see him about uh, the ban on food stamps for people who had drug felonies, and he said, uh, that this particular very conservative uh, religious lobbyist had just been to see him on that same issue. He said, are you two working together? And he felt my forehead like something might be wrong with me, which uh, was a, a pretty funny, I thought, that he never uh, believed that uh, the two of us would be working on the same bill together. I think that's sometimes what it takes uh, to have a winning coalition is that kind of diversity. Uh, we were really happy to have Nicole come spend three days with us uh, going around to see key legislators on uh, the House and Senate committees that deal with corrections and with law enforcement, with the courts. Uh, there were several committees like that. We also uh, spoke at a dinner that was hosted by the Legislative Black Caucus, which can be a very uh, uh, effective and powerful uh, caucus in our legislature at times because they're courted by both parties uh, for, for support on any issue where there might be a swing vote. Next slide, please. This year, uh, we had a, a House sponsor that was recruited by the Missouri Catholic Conference. Uh, Representative Paul Wheeland is a, a rural European-American uh, Republican. He's running for Senate this year, and he's the chair of the Catholic Caucus. Uh, our legislators here sometimes organize themselves into uh, to groups that, uh, that have some, um, some commonality, that, that belong to an affinity group of some type. And so, for a while, it was a Catholic conference, uh, and um, Paul, uh, in running for Senate, had, a, had an opponent uh, that the Catholic conference was smart enough to, um, to say, uh, how do we make sure that this doesn't become a negative campaign piece uh, in their Senate conference? So, um, there was an, uh, an agreement worked out uh, with uh, Representative Jeff Rorda, who was running against Wheeland for Senate, that they would both co-sponsor the bill. Uh, that would stress how important the bill was, that two people that were running against each other were both endorsing it. Uh, and it would also take off the table any fear that the other side 
uh, the other opponent would, would run any kind of a negative mailer about support for this particular bill. Um, and then we also had uh, a Senate uh, sponsor, Senator uh, Shalom Kiki Curls, who is uh, known for her progressive voting record and is, is African American. So uh, this again uh, demonstrated to people that this, this issue mattered to a whole lot of folks. Um, I think that we were helped by a couple of things. Uh, one was that uh, many legislators do have someone in their family with an addiction. So I think people are starting to understand this issue in a new way as more and more uh, education has happened about addiction over time. Uh, and also that the General Assembly has, had been saying no to, to many of us on a variety of issues um, uh, in 2014 and wanted to be able to say yes to us about something. We'd had a big fight here about uh, changing the income guidelines for Medicaid. Uh, and um, I think that, that there may have been some attempt to, um, uh, some, some of the legislators wanting to be able to say yes to us for something. I think we were helped by that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, uh, stories that touched hearts. Uh, this was mentioned earlier and uh, I think that that is just the real key because we have such bad public policy uh, about so many things because of nothing but prejudice. Uh, when people meet the object of their prejudice, it helps dispel the myths that are out there and we have a better chance of getting something passed. A couple of the folks that told their stories repeatedly to the media, to, to, to committee members, uh, in, uh, uh, through social media uh, were Christine McDonald. This is a woman who uh, lost her eyes because she refused to take a medicine that would have damaged her unborn child. That's the kind of story that touches a lot of hearts uh, here in Missouri where uh, there are only 40 out of almost 200 legislators who would vote in any kind of a uh, pro-choice kind of way. So a whole lot of uh, both sides of the aisle identify themselves as, as uh, pro-life in Missouri. Uh, and uh, Christine's story uh, is one that was held up by a lot of people as, as a uh, sort of a heroic story and, and uh, she told her story very well. Next slide. And then Johnny Waller Jr. Um, also uh, profiled in several stories uh, in uh, uh, print media uh, and was very effective in the committee. When, when the bill was heard in the Senate, uh, the chair of the committee that heard the bill was a, was a retired sheriff. Uh, and when Johnny mentioned that his four-year-old son, son was dying of cancer some years ago, uh, Johnny had committed an offense when he was a teenager. Uh, the Nebraska governor had since pardoned his offense, but Missouri would not, still not let him get uh, food stamps. Um, I saw uh, a little you know, gulp or a, an Adam's apple bob out of the former sheriff when Johnny was telling his story, and I could tell that, that there were some unshed tears there, that he was very touched by Johnny's story. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that I think can really move this forward, is, is uh, helping people get past their prejudices by meeting people in the flesh uh, who help them understand what's wrong uh, with a policy. Next slide, please. So in Missouri, when you want to pass a bill, the conventional wisdom is you have to get a bill out of committee before spring break. Um, we were able to get a hearing on uh, House Bill 1589 by Representative Whelan on February 11th, uh, and that was voted out of committee by February 18th. Spring break here is in sort of mid-March generally. Senate Bill 680 was heard on February 12th and voted due pass on March 5th. Um, and then uh, uh, the uh, Senate bill was first to come up for uh, debate, debate in one of the chambers. Uh, and uh, on April 2nd, we had about 200 students here for Student Advocacy Day, and that was one of two issues that they were talking to legislators about. And what a joy to have the Senate actually take it up and pass it 29 to 4 uh, on our Student Advocacy Day while we had uh, quite a bit of folks in the building. Uh, and, and that's just a remarkable vote uh, there, uh, given how uh, very partisan so many things are in the Missouri legislature. Uh, to have strong support on both of the sides of the aisle like that. Uh, and and we, would, we certainly used that, that first vote with being so strongly bipartisan uh, as evidence throughout the rest of our campaign. Next slide, please. As, a, as in any campaign, there will be some snarls that you have to, uh, to iron out 
we, we had hoped to uh, roll right on, but uh, Senate Bill 680 wasn't assigned to committee for several weeks, and there was, uh, you know, countless speculations about why is that, why is Speaker Jones and, and uh, the uh, uh, floor leader, uh, John Deagle, not, not moving this along, uh, you know, is it about future ambitions, is it they're afraid that it will be used against them in this kind of race or that kind of race. Uh, in, in the end, what seemed to help is, is uh, certainly we prepared the ground to make sure that we could get this moved onto the floor uh, for debate. Uh, but uh, um, uh, our action alerts and uh, visits by key advocates who are already in the building for some Medicaid lobby days uh, did not seem to do the job so much as when I call Senator Curls to say, we're just not having any luck getting this assigned. Uh, she said, you know, Speaker Jones and I were on the freshman tour together. This is uh, kind of a Missouri tradition is, is right after you're, you're elected, they, they tend to take you around to visit different parts of the state. Uh, and uh, people that get to know each other on that freshman, freshman tour bond together in a very special way. They spent a lot of time together even before they're sworn in. Uh, so she said, I'll just go see, uh, see Tim about it. Uh, since he and I were on the freshman tour together. So she went to visit his, his office, and I think later that day we heard that the bill was finally assigned to committee. Um, Representative Wheeland became the house handler as, as a, a sponsor of a similar house bill, uh, and uh, he also started uh, negotiating the, the language from Senate, Senate Bill 680 onto another bill, Senate Bill 727, a bill that dealt with farmers' markets um, uh, uh, using SNAP to get sort of a two-for-one match on buying food at farmers markets. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, both, both of our bills managed to pass in the final week of session, one on the day before the end of session and the other on the final day of session. So uh, we made it just in the nick of time. Next slide, please. Is there another slide, please? So um, Senator Nixon, I'm sorry, Governor Nixon signed uh, Senate Bill 680 into law on June 20th. He vetoed Senate Bill 727, uh, even though they basically contain the same language. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, there, uh, there's kind of a backstory there. He and the sponsor of 727 had been in a rather public battle. Uh, but uh, that bill did become law over the governor's veto during the September veto session. So not only did we win our bill once, uh, once this year, but we actually won it twice. The Senate, the Senate Bill 680 version did contain some punitive language around welfare reform, but much of that language already really is current practice. It's just not practice that legislators were particularly uh, um, aware of. Uh, and uh, some of it was also uh, barred by federal law, so it's unclear that those parts of the law can be carried out. It would take a waiver. and. Uh, at least for now, we don't think that waiver would happen. Uh, final slide, please. And here's what's in the Missouri law. Uh, if you successfully participate in uh, or accept treatment uh, and are on, a wait, are on a waiting list for treatment, uh, that's one of the, the criteria for being able to be removed for, from the, the ban. Uh, if a um, Division certified treatment provider says you do not need the treatment. If you're complying with all the obligations imposed by the court, the Division of Alcohol and Drug Abuse, and the Division of Probation and Parole, and if you do not have additional controlled substance felony offenses uh, a year after release from custody, uh, or if not committed to custody, such person does not have an additional controlled substance felony offense one year after the date of conviction, uh, your ban can be lifted, uh, but we do have a three strikes and you're out kind of rule that would get you back into a ban. Uh, however, uh, the, the data shows that there are very few people that have uh, two subsequent drug felonies after that first one. Um, so uh, this should uh, enable, um, in our, from, according to the Department of Social Services, uh, over 5,000 people uh, to be able to, to get um, access to SNAP who've been banned uh, in the first round of, of uh, new applications that would be allowed. And I wonder if you have any questions.
Thank you so much, um, Jessica and Jeanette, for sharing the political strategies and the communication strategies that uh, took place in California and Missouri to help you all pass reforms this year. Just want to highlight before we move on to the Q&A that there's still work to be done, and we really hope that the examples from Missouri and California can inspire the advocacy in other states um, that need to move forward, and also at the federal level. Obviously, um, a policy goal that would move us all forward is for Congress to repeal the felony drug ban, ban on TANF and on SNAP, but given the politics inside the Beltway, um, there's a lot of work that states can do. And um, there's a couple of uh, points highlighted here. One is uh, for states that have a, full in, a fully enforced ban, working to modify that ban to include the possibility of regaining eligibility um, would be one option. For states with a current uh, modified ban, there may be, um, uh, it may be politically viable for advocates to work at expanding eligibility if possible. And of course, following um, in what Missouri did this year, if for states that continue to have a fully enforced ban, working um, to opt out of it completely, um, hopefully is possible, even if it takes years uh, and a lot of organizing and broadening um, of coalitions to do that. And finally, I just want to remind folks on the call that there is a report on our website um, that you can find at sentencingproject.org that lists out uh, the various states and, and the policies in your state. And so uh, we encourage you uh, to look that up. And if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to be in touch with us, and we can help you work through a local analysis and um, talk about what the political strategies might be in your state in terms of organizing going forward and expanding eligibility um, for people with prior felony drug convictions. And with that, I hope there are questions, and we want to open it up uh, to have a dialogue before we end the webinar this afternoon. Great. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you also, Jessica and Jeanette, for your presentations. We will have a Q&A now. We have about nine minutes. Um, if you're typing in a question to us about a specific slide or to a specific person, please note that in the question. Um, so we already have a few questions that have come in. Um, one is, how did you all work with law enforcement? Um, and did you have outspoken opposition from law enforcement um, as you were advocating for these reforms? Um, Jeanette and Jessica, do, we, do either one of you take one? Do either one of you want to take this? Sure. Uh, this is Jeff Bartholo here in Western Center. I will go ahead and start. Um, you know, the law enforcement was our uh, primary uh, opponents all along throughout the many years. Um, and it wasn't until we, we faced uh, the prison realignment, until we faced the federal lawsuit on the, on the prison population, uh, that we were able to kind of start flipping it and, and, and demonstrate that we had a solution that was shown to reduce prison size because it was shown to reduce recidivism. Um, and at the same time, there were critiques of, you know, kind of coming at law enforcement um, that they didn't take uh, safety in low-income communities as seriously. Again, this is a policy that um, supports safety in low-income communities. And, and um, you know, and finally, I think, uh, really work, what, what really sealed the deal for us in trying to get some of those allies to come to our side, um, and in the end the probation and parole officers uh, were our main allies in the, in the, in the conversation, was, um, was being able to, to show um, how we could be working together at the local community through these programs to create jobs and support jobs and, and stable housing. Um, and, and these partnerships, these kind of working partnerships in the local communities to prevent recidivism were what made the difference. We never, um, we never did get uh, the support of the sheriffs or the district attorneys, but uh, the district attorneys were, um, I think, visited by the probation and parole officers, um, and, and they, they've been in all the hearings, and, and they, they fell kind of to more a silent opposition, especially because we had a number of district attorneys from San Diego to San Francisco signing on to, uh, to support the bill and sending in their own letters and some of them even you know, presenting web videos um, about why this was so important. So we had, uh, we had the support of, of some in the district attorney's community which helped us to, to kind of lift 
uh, the whole association, the statewide association, away from a strong opposition. Um, that I, I think that sums up our our, our story on that, um, our answer to that question. Great, thank you. Um, another question that we have is, what technical assistance is available for state groups interested in pursuing changes in the law? Great. Well, this is Nicole, and, and I'd be happy to help with that. So at the sentencing project, we can certainly work with state groups who want to look at how the state policy applies in your jurisdiction, so we can work with you on a state and local analysis. Um, on the TANF assistance ban, we did estimate the number of women who may be impacted by the ban in full um, ban states, and so that can certainly help states like Georgia and Texas and other Full band state, other full band states that may be on the call, and in other states that may not be a full band state, um, we can also work through trying to figure out what the impact is in your state. And if you are a modified band state, we can explore an analysis around expanding eligibility and what a political strategy might be in your state if there's work to be done in terms of addressing this issue. So please feel free to be in touch with us. And we can also help look at the political strategies that might work in your state and talk through that and, um, you know, have ideas around uh, what might work um, in various states around reform. So we'd be happy to talk to you more about all of that. Wonderful. Um, we have another question, which I think is for Jeanette. Um, someone's asking for... Um, a little more clarification on um, Christine McDonald's story and um, her connection to this issue. Sure. Christine uh, was banned from getting food stamps because of a prior drug felony, but part of her story was that during a, during a pregnancy um, she developed uh, an eye condition that could, could be treated by a medicine, but she chose not to take the eye, eye medicine and had her child, and she, she and her mentioning this as uh, part of her story uh, tended to impress some folks in Missouri who, who, who uh, really valorize women who choose to have uh, children in hard circumstances like that. So uh, that, that's what the connection was, is, is that uh, given the nature of the Missouri legislature, uh, her being banned uh, at, at, uh, uh, d despite losing her sight, uh, which makes her harder to employ, she now is employed and actually as her own not-for-profit uh, agency, uh, but, but that story did touch a lot of hearts here in Missouri where folks care about stories like that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think Jessica has also has a story that she'd like to share um, while we're on the topic of personal stories. Um, hi. Definitely a commonality between um, California and Missouri and and our way to success on these campaign re, uh, on these ban repeals was a highlighting of stories and um, and I just want to give a shout out to uh, one person who did share her story um, throughout the last year of the campaign Rosie Flores she's on the call and um, you know as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation we partnered with a lot of grassroots organizations to, to elevate uh, this issue and the story. Uh, Rosie comes out of Starting Over Inc. and and the coalition. All of us are none of us. Um, and you know, and I, and I and while I agree, I think it's important to um, bring forward stories that speak to specific populations within the legislative body or within um, within the decision making um, community. I think every story, when told genuinely. And um, and that articulates, uh, you know, the hopes and aspirations of the person um, that's impacted by the ban and their children and their community is powerful. So I would just encourage people to start collecting stories, start getting them out there, and and prepare people for the kind of real judgment that will be placed upon them, um, and 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 know that that's unavoidable, but mostly um, helping helping people to be part of the campaign and on a regular basis I think is is really key. Great, thank you. Um, one last question. Um, did Missouri also have a ban on TANF? Um, Jeanette, could you speak to that? 
Uh, yes, we do have a ban on TANF. That will be a harder lift in our legislature, unfortunately. Uh, attitudes toward TANF are, are very punitive here. We actually haven't even raised our welfare benefits since 1991 when they went up $3 from where they were in 1975. So there's, there's a lot of work to do around TANF, uh, and, uh, and I do believe that we ought to, uh, to, to tackle that. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, that's the end of our Q&A. If anyone has um, any additional questions, um, they're welcome to contact either the Sentencing Project at staff at sentencingproject.org. Um, we'll also be sending out the webinar slides, which will have the contact information for the other panelists. Um, and a recording of the webinar will also be available online. Um, information on how to access both the slides and the recording will be sent via email. So thank you so much again to Nicole and Jessica and Jeanette for a wonderful webinar today, and thank you to everyone who attended.